coming up on this episode of Belief Hole. In the last days of summer, when autumn winds begin to whisper darkly among the trees, the unspoken things within the woods are watching ever more closely at the campers huddled around their dimming fires. What dark phantoms wait among the shadows with wide eyes and gnashing teeth? From grinning ghosts in cabin corners to unsettling encounters with the fairy folk. On this episode of Belief Hole, we bring you Camp Creepily Part 2. Terrifying true tales of the darker forest trails and campground accounts with the forgotten and hidden things. Synchronicity, Sasquatch, Homunculus, Alien Races, Satanism in Hollywood, MK Ultra, Tartaria. There's like a whole, I've been watching this one guy. Like, close the door, in. Jeremy, close your door! What's the uh, inner earth disagreements? Ghost Dad. <laughs> I like that movie. Dogman, Bohemian Grove, Corey Feldman, Magicians are Demons, Specters, and Spirit spooks, Summonings, Sleep Strange Disappearances, Sky Whale Phenomena, yes. Alternative History, Shadow People. Shh, quiet, I'm trying to say words with the mouth. It's getting dicey out there. Poltergeists. That's cool. And Naki. What is the moon? <laughs> Elf Towers. I would never talk about it. That's old. Y2K. Cover ups. Apocalyptic catastrophe. Vampire. Vampire. Hello, hello. Hello, hello. Hi, I'm Jeremy. My name is John. And I'm Chris. And we are your hosts, the brothers of the Belief Hole. Welcome back to another spooky, fun, freaky episode. This one's going to be special. Yes. Why? We are wrapping <laughs> up the summer season with Camp Creepily Part 2. <laughs> Camp Creepily? Yes. Do you remember we did a <laughs> long pause? Wait, what? It's been a while since we did it. I but... thought it was Camp Creepy, but. You know, I had a conversation with Chris about this because Creepily isn't a word. It's not Camp Creepily. It's our word. Or Camp Creepy. It had a, a more fun flow to it, I thought, than Creepy. Yeah, it definitely has a little. Camp Creepily. Hey, it works for me. And if you guys don't know what this is, we did uh, the first edition of this kind of series idea back in season two. Yeah. It's we'll, been link a while. That, we'll link that in the show notes, but. Uh, it's a lot of fun. It's kind of just a way to celebrate the kind of the end of summer turning to fall. Right before the leaves start to change, you're still out, you're camping, experiencing kind of the heart of the magic of the end of summer. Yeah. But if you guys have noticed being outside, like I've noticed, especially the past like week or two, you can smell fall coming, even though it's yeah. not quite, even though it's hot still. Definitely. Like a couple of days ago, I felt, yeah, just the inklings of mm-hmm. starting to change. Exactly. And then I saw the 14 foot skeleton in my neighbor's yard. Oh, they got one down there? <laughs> yeah. That's awesome. I thought you were going to say, I have the same experience, but walking into like any hardware store. I do like that. Like the Halloween yeah. section. It's so early, but. It makes the world magical. It does make it. And those yeah. skeletons are so tall now. They make like those blow up <laughs> things that are just so enormous. Yeah. Well, I like the skeletons that are, they're not blow up, but they're still gigantic. Do you yeah. see those? Is that the one your neighbor has? Yeah, it's like actual plastic. It's a real giant skeleton. It's pretty cool. Yeah. It's the one on that main road, and there's like 75 things in their yard Mm -hmm. already. Their neighbors must hate them. I drove past and approaching the house, I thought they were having a get together, and I realized they're all just skeletons. (laughs) (laughs) But that's awesome. It's a real lively party. That's right. Yeah, man, I love this time of year, coming up to Halloween. Yeah, it's a magical time. Since it is the end of summer, the end of the time of camping and being in the woods and hiking, There's no better time than to do a Camp Creepily Part 2, telling stories focused on the strange experiences people have camping in the forest or being in the woods in general, but mostly camping, camping or being at camp. I really want to- trying to to contain the theme here. I really wanted to find almost strictly- being at a camp. Right. With camp counselors. Like Camp, like camp Ugachuka. Right. Like the there tales. are tons of those out there that I was able to find. I do have one we're going to start off with, but um, but these are all camping related. They are all purportedly true. Yes. True stories. No creepypasta here, as far as we know. Right. But you know, the thing about camping stories, campfire stories, like urban legends, I feel like that's fair game. 
that's not what we're doing today. Like yeah. in our Camp Creepily episode one, if you guys want to check that out, link in the show notes, we did do a little conversation about the Hookman and the urban legends that you tell around campfires, right? And the babysitter in the house. Oh yeah. We just some classic stuff. And I like exploring those stories. But yeah, our show generally leans towards true stories. That wasn't Camp Creepily though. That was our first Halloween episode. Well, we did it. Yeah. <laughs> but I like hunting for new stories and stories that are supposedly real. Things yeah. that happen to people. And of course, with the theme today, yeah, it's going to be involving being at camp, hiking, the spirit of being in the wilderness and some stories you could tell around the fire and see yourself there because that's where these take place. And this ties into the idea that we covered before of Sylvan Dread. That feeling you get sometimes when you're alone in the wilderness and panic just sets in. Exactly. Sylvan Dread comes from the Roman god, Sylvanus, the protector of the forest. The you're feeling, so smart, Chris. I just have Wikipedia <laughs> open. But uh, oh. <laughs> don't say Wikipedia. We go deeper than that. But it's, uh, we've talked about many times on the show, we, you know, Tim Marchenko's great book, Disembodied Voices, which will be coming up today. Oh, and it goes back to Pan because we've talked about this before, but that feeling of panic that some people get in the woods, the idea is, and going back into the mythology, Pan was the god, the satyr, right? The god of, depending on who you're asking, merriment, fertility, kind of a playful, mischievous forest deity. Forest, yeah, spirit. But they would sacrifice to Pan make sacrifices to avoid the feeling of panic. That's where panic comes from, is that feeling really? of terror and dread you get in the wild. That's where the word comes from? Mm -hmm. Panic comes from pan, and that fear you experience in the woods. You're so smart, Jeremy. Thanks. Because your brain's so big. <laughs> it's because we research for the show. But so that's really interesting that that connects, because it also connects to ear stories of people experiencing things in the wilderness. So many fascinating stories have come across, and a lot of them... They'll be as simple as having a, that connective thread of the dread, the sylvan dread, the panic, the feeling you get. But it also ties in with the Oz effect or the Oz factor, which was coined by Jenny Randall's mm -hmm. in the 1980s. That's that experience of having suddenly realizing that everything in the forest has gone still and quiet. And for no explainable reason, the feeling of again being watched, but where you almost felt like you've stepped out of time and space. Right. You, you are now in a different realm. It's kind of that, that exactly. sensation. And it's also referred to as fairy mood. I think that's a similar, it's a, you know, across the pond. I'm not sure if I've ever had that experience. I've definitely had the feeling of like being watched or feeling like I need to move faster through the woods, especially at night. Oh, you've been in the woods by yourself at night? Yeah. That little patch between mom, mom and dad's in the church. <laughs> it's like, uh, it's about 20 yards. <laughs> but you know, when I was younger, we were, we were, uh, out in Texas. It was a big bend maybe. Oh yeah. It was our friend's bachelor getaway. It was us. John's bachelor party. Yeah. Our friend John and our friend Pat was there. And the second night we went out in this area and it was like we were all walking out there and realized that everything was, we had gotten quiet and we all felt like everything, it was just an unsettling feeling. We felt like something was wrong. Remember that? Like it was a different world. We ended up leaving. We set up the tent. It was like four o'clock in the afternoon, planned to stay another night. And we just all kind of agreed something didn't feel right. We weren't like, you know, we didn't know what to put our finger on, but it was very ominous. felt off and ominous. Yeah, very ominous feeling. It felt like purgatory. It felt like we were yeah. in a different land. And yeah, we, I always, I know what you're talking we about. We left and it was, as we were leaving, we got a call coming through bad reception mom saying that uncle john didn't have much time it turns out he had terminal cancer so oh, we always put weird. it to that like we were yeah. all picking up on that but it could have been this i mean it it sounds just like this oz effect yeah. sort of sensation well i tell you what if you were by yourself in one of, i mean like i can imagine the feeling i've been in the woods you know with people and i'm like man if i was here by myself at night i would definitely be feeling that yeah it's not hard to imagine right you know yeah exactly and when you couple that with a sort of shared feeling of foreboding with right. whoever you're with there's seemingly no reason to be feeling that way, especially when you include that silence. Yeah, that sudden quiet. That's when it seems like there is a potential supernatural element that's underlying the experience. Something watching. Yeah, exactly. And actually, one of our listeners, Jen, she uh, lives out in Montana and they're up in the mountains. And same thing, she was relaying a story where she was out with a friend four-wheeling and they stopped. They were way off, kind of off path. And they walked out to this cliff about 50 yards or something, and they both immediately had this sense of something's wrong. This isn't right. They both looked at each other and said, we should go. And yeah. saying it out loud scared them even more. No reason other than they realized everything was quiet, this stillness, and they just felt like being watched or something. Got back on the four wheelers, and the whole time she's like avoiding looking left and right or behind her because you feel like if you look, you're going to make something appear like there's yeah. something there. And it's an experience that experienced hikers and hunters in the same patch of woods they've been a thousand times will suddenly experience extreme terror for no yeah. reason. There's a man we'll hear from later on in this episode, one of our listeners actually, who had 
who had that experience of after 66 years of hiking in the woods, never had an experience of suddenly being terrified for no explanation, knowing he shouldn't be in an area. And then he has this sensation 66 years into his life. So what we'll tell that story. I know we need to get into the meat of it, but I wanted to tell you something about a Bigfoot thing that I saw. What? <laughs> you know how I'm not a fan of Bigfoot. Yeah. It's not that you're not a fan. I think you're just indifferent. I just don't think it's that it's interesting. It's like the cooking channel to you. You're it's like, not that I don't think it's real. Right. You. Th- so there's a thing out there. It's, yeah. And it's just it like an me? ape in the woods. I don't know. It just never like struck me as all that interesting. That's your or, opinion. Th- let me, let me yeah, finish the story. But <laughs> <laughs> there's this channel that I watch occasionally on YouTube. It comes up this girl that travels around the United States. But one of these groups of people that hunt Bigfoot contacted her and she went out with them in mm-hmm. Oregon. Yeah. And it was amazing. When she went out with them, just being out there, I've been to places in Washington, like Mount Rainier. Oh, yeah. And like... Big, big for country. When they were looking out for them, I don't know. It's just like I understood why they did it. Once you put yourself in that place. calls and stuff. And when you're out there, it's so like prehistoric feeling. Like I just understood like, oh, yeah, that would... When you're there, it's a totally different thing than just thinking about some, you know, gorilla in the woods. Like it's... It's enchanting, magical, and also kind of scary. Yeah. yeah. And I do think like they found tracks, like huge tracks. They showed all the evidence they had gathered over the years. And I understand why people are super interested in it. I yeah. had an inkling of that. So I want you to know <laughs> I'm glad that you I've had a that. little bit of a change of heart when okay, it comes it makes, to that. that makes me now, if they were out there hunting a new kind of gorilla, would you be as yeah. interested? But no. there, So there is to you, there is something about Bigfoot that is Yeah, different. no, it has to be like, there's there's more to it than just a gorilla. Well, yeah, I mean, we look at, we did the freakiest of Bigfoot experiences yeah. that we covered. It was Harry High Strangeness. Remember that episode? That was an expansion. It was an expansion. Check it out, guys. But it was one of my favorite episodes, but we covered the most extreme and bizarre Bigfoot experiences, everything from the human zoo on the spacecraft. Mm-hmm. Remember the one that talked? So many unexplained encounters. Yeah, the mystical side. Yeah, of when Bigfoot. you include the high strangeness in with Bigfoot. I mean, it, to me, it just, it goes so much further to explain how something like that could yeah. exist out in the deep, wild pockets of the earth. Well said. Let's get into some creepy camping stories, Chris. All right. So we're not just talking about Harry High Strangeness. We're not just talking about Sylvan Dread, Panic in the Forest. We're also going to be talking about Ghost Kids at Camp, which I'm excited for this one. Occult Strangeness in the Woods. So some possible ritualistic things. Oh, the robed entities. Yes. Shared dreams of cloaked creatures. John, I think you'll find these stories specifically interesting. And of course, the idea of the forest tricking you deeper into its clutches, into its darkness. Yeah. A few stories about that coming up where it's, it feels like there's something is set a trap. And it goes to the possible explanation of the missing 411 phenomena, people disappearing strangely, inexplicable stories in the woods. There are hints of, of these almost taken stories, and that's where I got some of these stories coming up, was real people leaving comments on large videos on YouTube and stuff where they go into a famous account of missing 411, almost taken, and then people are like, this happened to me, or something very similar, and they sound very real. And I think these are real people posting, so we've got a couple of those accounts that might shine a light on the phenomena. So the stories are coming from a multitude of different sources, and I tried to vet the reality of the experience by looking at, for example, when I grabbed from Reddit, I made sure that the user, you know, you go to their account, you see what they're posting, and if they're posting multiple paranormal stories, I ignore those. Yeah, we talked about that before. Yeah, so that's what I did with these, and we'll have links to these in the show notes for the original sources. And then we also have some stories coming from a really good book when we get to a couple really fun Fay stories at the end of the episode from a classic. Oh, yes, the fairy census. Right. Which, if you guys haven't heard of this, is as strange as it sounds, a data driven archive of cross corroborative accounts of, yeah, fairy encounters, a veritable treasure trove. A panoply. A panoply of accounts. Cornucopia. A cornucopia. Um, a menagerie, really. And yeah, this comes <laughs> from the fairy census. And so I have a section coming up. There's just a couple stories that we probably have time for. And it's in the section called, What the F are Fairies? <laughs> and any new listeners out there who are like fairies, come on. Yeah. Just go back and listen to our two-part series on fairies and the little people folklore. It's so mind-blowing, the cross-cultural connections from native tribes in the Americas to the Nisa in Scandinavia. and to how the Duende in Spain and Mexico. Just specific elements, like how, how is it possible that they have such crossover with right. the lore? Anyway... Let's get into some of our stories. Let's get into the woods, guys. Put your backpack on. Let's start with the classic tale of camping creepiness, Chris. Yes. John, will you take us away 
This one comes from Richie Tyrone, and he shared this July of this year. When I was 12 years old, I went to an outdoor school camp for three days. Practically our whole grade was there. It was Camp Chief Hector. I still remember my counselor's name. It was Coda. I had a lot of fun there, but I would get extremely scared when nighttime came. My room was located at the very end of the hall inside the cabin, right next to the emergency exit doors. It was me and my friend, along with two people we didn't like inside that room. On my first night, I had horrible vibes from this room. Something about it felt so strange. It was just two bunk beds and one window, a little square room at the end of the hall, and it just had a horrible presence. I made it through one night and the rest of the day was fine. My second night was worse, and I began to think that something was outside our window, even though there was no evidence of this. After the second night, it was clear that everyone in that room was getting bad vibes, but my friends in the very next room didn't. I had no idea why until the third night. On the third night, I was woken by a light in the hallway. The door to our room had been left open. The light was faint since it was way down the hall. One of the guys in our room had left the door open when they went out. I was on the bottom bed of the left bunk facing the door and my friend was on the top bed of the opposite bunk. My friend was also awake, I just didn't know it yet. When I woke up, I automatically put on my glasses and was looking around until I saw the coat rack in the corner move. The coat rack had our coats on it and next to it was a chest with drawers. Someone was in the coat, but on top of the chest. I will always remember this. It was a littler boy, smaller than me. He was white with short hair, but I couldn't make out any clothing. He wasn't naked, but I could only see the silhouette of his body. His hands were up covering his face. He was crouched in a frog position, almost on top of the chest. I was stuck there just staring at this kid I had never seen before. I said nothing. Here's the worst part. He lowered his hands and revealed his face. He was staring at me, smiling with a huge smile. His eyes were huge. He kept staring, but slowly he was moving off the chest, getting closer. I was stuck, and my friend this whole time was seeing what was happening. He was also frozen. Then suddenly, my guy Jason, the guy from the washroom, came back running down the hall and slammed the door shut. Me and my friend were suddenly out of our trance and we got up instantly and flinged out our flashlights pointing to the corner. Did you see that? The kid was gone. I explained to my friend why I had pointed my flashlight to the corner and then he did the same. We both saw the same thing and to this day, we still talk about it sometimes. I remember the whole thing so vividly. It's crazy how my friend and I both saw it. When I got home, I told my family what had happened and I began my research to see if anything had happened at that camp. I didn't find anything. So this is my story. 2017, Camp Chief Hector, Alberta. That's when it happened. Oh, so it's Canada. Yeah, pretty freaky. Yeah, at first I was thinking, it reminded me of that time I saw Jake staring at my face. I woke up in the middle yeah. of the night and it was just my jeans folded up in a weird way. Mm -hmm. And I was terrified I didn't move for like 30 minutes. But the fact that they both saw it. Yeah. Corroboration from his friend on the other bunk. And it moved towards him too. Definitely can visualize it. Yeah. Just that impression of you think you see something on, on the chest next to the coat yeah. rack. You can see the coat rack move first. Or trying to rationalize it. And then the creepy part obviously is the it's covering its face. And then Until it's he smiles. slowly brings his hands down, smiles, and then comes towards you. I mean... Definitely very cinematic yeah. sounding. Where's this, Alberta? Alberta, Canada. Okay. Yeah, this is, so and the interesting thing about this is, yeah, there, I didn't find anything about tragic event at this camp. And this camp has moved over the years. It was initially 1930s was opened. This area is so magical looking. Um, 
This is the ghost wilderness area. And I think this is interesting. So this comes from the Calgary Guardian, just for a little background on the area, because I think this is really fascinating, even though it doesn't directly relate to a tragedy that might create a, a specter in this cabin. There's a history of phantasmic lore there. So this comes from the Calgary Guardian. The entire ghost area is one rich with history. The first recorded visit was by Sir George Simpson, the governor of Hudson Bay's company. But the name Ghost wasn't used to describe the area until Dr. James Hector, a surgeon, arrived with the Palliser expedition. The name was in reference to a stony legend from the Stony Nation that talked of ghosts patrolling the riverbank, searching for the skulls of defeated warriors after doing battle with the Cree. The skulls were then placed on the steep walls of nearby Devil's Head Mountain to appease its spirit. Large flat-topped mountains such as Devil's Head were believed to be inhabited by spirits and carried a high degree of respect within many First Nation communities, so regular offerings to the mountain were necessary. Due to its visibility and unique protruding peak, Devil's Head was also a useful signpost. First Nations and Europeans alike used these highly visible mountains as a means of navigation. Additional stories also exist that place numerous First Nation grave sites along the banks of the Ghost River. And Dr. Hector even mentions that the forest atop Dead Man Hill, located between the Ghost and Bow Rivers, is actually one big burial ground. And this is what's interesting, is this whole area has names like this. All these sort of dark themes. Um, Black Rock Mountain, Ghost River, Devil's Cap, Phantom Crag, Ghost Lakes, Dead Man's Flats, Spectral Peak, all this sort of you know, supernatural, yeah, sort of macabre labeling of the geography there. But the place is incredibly beautiful. It was well, some pictures in the show notes, but um, definitely would like to check that area out. Beauty and darkness. Yeah, all these episodes just make me want to go out uh, west again. I know. Yeah, I've never seen Banff. Banff. Oh yeah, it's in Alberta. It's crazy how beautiful it is. It's like crystal whitish blue waters. It almost looks tropical, except it's in the middle of you know the mountains. Yeah, we've talked about stuff in Banff area before. Mm-hmm. But yeah, so that began our, our episode. I hope you enjoyed that story. <laughs> Did that begin it? That began it. I'm now back at camp. Yeah, let's get weirder, Chris. Yeah, this, this gets weirder. This gets a little more introspective. And John, I feel like these will be right up your alley. Jim, why don't you read this first one? Hooded creatures come at night. Went camping out near McLeod, California, down Squaw Valley, with my ex. And that night, we both had the exact same dream. It was of eight black hooded creatures surrounding our car. Then one of them put both hands on the rear window of our car and looked in at us. The dream was extremely realistic. Everything was exactly the same, straight down to the time setting, very early about 5 or 6 a.m. Our visual perspective for each part of the dream, the description of the entities, even the feeling we had during the dream, which was a very cautious awareness of how powerful these things were. Not quite scared, but definitely a little on edge. We started doing research and figured maybe they were some kind of forest watchers. It felt like they were warning us not to tamper with the woods. We did notice someone had littered some drug needles in the area, which we found to be really bizarre because we didn't think anyone really knew about the spot. Love that area dearly. It's where I spent most of my life and it's truly an energetic and supernatural hotspot. Yeah. I just thought this was interesting, the shared dream aspect. So this couple is camping, sleeping in their car, but they both dream about these dark cloaked figures approaching the car and looking in at them. They both have the same reaction to these things. And at the same time period of the morning, my thought was I would consider like maybe this wasn't a dream. We both experienced this the same night. Like was this because I'm kind of like screen memory or some kind of, you know, we've heard things like that before Mm -hmm. where there is this kind of experience. And if two people share it, especially... And then they come to like realize it later. Yeah. That something may have actually happened. Yeah. And what, what made this even more compelling was that someone followed up a response to this saying that they had a very similar experience. And this happened, this is McLeod, California. Yeah. So I Googled this and found out it's right at the foot of Mount Shasta. Yeah. You heard much about Mount Shasta, John? Yeah. Just it's a strange, really magical, magical, mysterious place. Yeah. Tons of lore with that, including like entrances to the hollow earth. UFO stuff too, oh, I think. Yeah, for tons. sure. Entities, UFOs, uh-huh. you name it. Underground bases. Yeah, portals. Interestingly, we covered in our last episode a little bit of the Darrow, I guess in the expansion episode, which goes back to um, the Shaver mystery, the inner earth, but reportedly seen in this area, and this goes back 
plenty of different accounts outside of what you just read, but it happens to be in the same area, are accounts of these hooded phantoms in this area. Yeah. So it doesn't sound like they were aware of this at all. Right. But even going back to the concept of the Darrow, whether you believe in those or not, as these kind of goblin creatures that live underground that occasionally come up in their black robed cloaked creatures. Sounds exactly like what they're describing. Yeah. And whether or not that's the sort, like if it, they are the Darrow, or if there's something else out there that's described this way, we have that lore there going back for a long time, including giants in white cloaks, other kinds of hooded phantoms and just strange right. things. So maybe there is something there. Yeah. In reading these, this account, it just made me think of the movie Phantasm. Oh, those yeah. little cloaked creatures, the, almost like Ewok-like things that, would, that lived in the graveyard. They were basically, I think, taking the dead to become slaves in a parallel world or something. Yeah. I don't think I've ever seen that movie. Really? Are you sure? I thought, thought we talked about it before. I know we've talked about it, but I don't think I've seen it from... Very odd movie. End. Very odd. I used to put it on to sleep, too. But that's why I'm so odd. It's a really good movie. But I think one of the compelling things about this account, John, was that there was a follow-up to this that sounds very similar. John, will you read this one? I had almost the exact same dream while camping up north from you in Oregon. I was camping at a lake in southern Oregon. You were near Mount Shasta. The whole Cascade mountain range is weird. Lots of weird and ominous stuff happens. Anyways, I was at a spot off a logging road that is on the shoreline of the lake. It was essentially a clearing right off the dirt logging road. No other campers or people for miles. I was sleeping in the back of my SUV when I had the dream. Like yours, everything felt realistic and surreal. In my dream, I had numerous black robed creatures that were right outside my truck. They gave off a freaky and ominous vibe. They felt almost demonic. I remember that beyond the area of my vehicle and the creatures, it was blacker than black. Like, I could see out my window and everything within a 50 feet circle, but nothing other than that. I woke up in cold sweats and a little freaked out. I felt like these beings were definitely malevolent. I immediately broke down camp, which wasn't hard as I had no tent to set up, and left that spot in the middle of the night. I ended up driving to the nearest town and sleeping in a parking lot before heading to a state park campground the next day. To this day, I still think about that dream. So weird. Another dream in there. Dreams can be powerful. I've been having some weird ones lately where it's like black cloaked figures approaching you. (laughs) Dreams. And it's really weird too because I've been in a very positive mood lately. Mm -hmm. But I have these like really dark dreams, like in the middle of the night, right around three o'clock. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And I I go through phases of them. But the reason I bring that up is just because sometimes you have the dreams where you just can't shake that they're. They're just not, they're not part of your subconscious. They're They're more than a dream. Like something's interfering with your, Mm -hmm. your sleep. Putting it in there, you know? Yeah. Yeah, It sounds like in these stories in that area, in the Cascades, Mm -hmm. these people are having these dreams. Is there something out there potentially? If they're telling the truth. It's interesting too, that the, the two different experiencers have a different perspective on like the first people are like, these are powerful and forest watchers. Right. And the other person seeing the same thing, experiencing seemingly the same thing, says that it was more of a demonic feel. So right. there's an interesting interpretation going on. Well, it's on. weird too. These hooded things, it's California. And if you guys are interested, oh, yeah. this does kind of connect to... The Dark Watchers. The Dark Watchers, yeah, you remember. Yeah. That was a really interesting episode of people seeing these things in kind of Big Sur area in California. This lore that goes back, some say, to when the Spanish first arrived, the conquistadors, naming them the... The Dark Watchers. Yeah, really fascinating lore around that. Yeah, and I found a piece of evidence in that that, that proves their existence. So definitely check out that <laughs> uh, expansion episode. But it's interesting that that was such a weird, freaky story about dreams. Because I just remembered, I had a dream last night. You did? After researching the fairies, the fairy lore, mm-hmm. some of these weird little creatures. I was dreaming, I'm assuming it was a dream, of uh, some small creature that was like, warning me kind of in a dark scary way about something i forget what it was and i woke up to what was that seven knocks what yeah and i just i assumed that it, there's no one at the door but i was so real that i was like it could be kids like knocking what hour was the this? door in the middle of the night i mean i heard it from upstairs so it was loud what hour Four thirty in the morning okay yeah um you want to go to the you door you think you actually heard knocks 
Yeah. I mean, you know how sometimes you're not sure when you wake up and you hear something, but it was so real that like I was, I was telling myself like, okay, it's probably kids messing around if, if I did hear it. But it, you know, usually I'll know if I wake up and there's like a bang and like, oh, it was in my dream. But this was one of those times where it was so real that I wasn't sure if someone was at the door. That's why you need a dog. A dog would let me know. That's for sure. If the dog's not barking, then it definitely was in my head. I just had a vision of someone like being chased by a maniac and they really needed help. And you're just like, eh, for nothing. They're just like, no, wait. Yeah, I think if I heard somebody yelling help, I'd be even more scared. (laughs) (laughs) You would be like, I didn't hear that going back to sleep. (laughs) If he needs help, then that means I'm probably going to need help if I help him. turn up the rain noise machine. You're like, what? I can't hear you. (laughs) Didn't order pizza, thanks. (laughs) All right, let's move on. Yes, let's go to the Nightwalkers. This story I call Nightwalkers in the California Woods. And this was reported in 2021. Jeremy, go ahead. Okay. And this is not to be confused with the Nightwalker phenomena. Right. right? The kind of cryptid, quote unquote. Right. The this legs. is something separate. You'll see. Okay. A few years ago, my mom and I decided to take a road trip. We were going to different camping, hiking spots along the California coast. And we were in the Big Sur area at the time of this particular incident. It was getting to be later in the day, so we had been sort of scrambling to find a campsite to sleep at. I can't remember the exact details, but for some reason we ended up going up this long, windy mountain road that seemed to go up forever. Eventually at the top we found a secluded site with camp spots, and even a bathroom. We didn't see anyone around, but the sun was about to go down, so we figured we could find the person in charge in the morning and pay them then. By now it was dark, and we had been around the fire a few hours. Our sight was right at the edge of the trees. I heard some rustling coming from that direction and looked up. Two people were walking, one in front of the other, dressed in all white, perfectly clean clothes. The person in front had their arm behind to hold the other's hand, but they both looked straight ahead, didn't acknowledge me or my mom whatsoever. They walked out of the woods past us and right back into the trees. Here's what's weird. Both had no flashlights, were barefoot, had no belongings with them, and were not dressed warmly. It was probably around 40 degrees, pitch dark, and rough terrain. Not to mention the gut-wrenching, heart-drop feeling I got when I saw them. I asked my mom if she saw them, and she said no. Even though she was facing the same direction as me. I was on edge the rest of the night and had trouble sleeping. In the morning, my mom found the camp owner, paid him, and told him what I had seen. He replied nonchalantly, Oh yeah. Those are the night walkers. People see them around here sometimes. When she asked him if he thought this was paranormal, he said, Pretty damn sure. We got the hell out of there as soon as we could. Yeah, strange story. I mean, was it paranormal? The caretaker seemed to, seemed to think so. Well, he had a name for them. They're the night walkers. So maybe they were... I mean, could it have been just some people out in the woods maybe yeah. lost? But it, obviously interesting that it was very cold. They were wearing light clothing. They weren't responding to the Sounds people that were ghostly. camping. I wouldn't feel very comfortable if no. I saw them. Well, especially and if the guy said, oh yeah, we got a name That's for those things. mom didn't see him. That is kind of weird. Maybe only the chosen. Maybe they were just ghosties. Yeah, I don't know. Did you not like that one? Maybe I should have left the one out. Maybe we should have... I thought it was interesting. I, was, I think it's okay. It's pretty good. What do you guys think out it's there? It's no... Oh man... There are some stories that I kept out of this episode that will have to be in the next edition, but John, some of them are, are freaky. Yeah. Why didn't you bring them? Well, we had to decide on like between 30 stories we found, which ones we had time so to include. you pick the crappy ones? <laughs> well, Chris, picked- no, these are all really good. Aren't they? <laughs> weren't they? <laughs> um, no, this I next one, good. this next one's pretty excellent. I think it's called Stalked by Monsters. Chris, why don't you read this? I'll read this one. Okay, good. I like that. I don't know. Let's do it. Ready? Here we go. This is from Quentin Stark. My friends and I used to camp a lot in the El Dorado National Forest. We had a spot along Sapiago Springs we used to camp at a lot. One weekend, we decided to go for a three-day foraging camp. We brought in MREs in case we couldn't find anything, some guns, and some supplies to set up shelter. But that's about it. First night was chill. We cooked a bunch of crawdads and a squirrel my buddy shot, drank a few beers we'd brought, and slept fine. 
The next day, something felt off to me. One of my friends and I had some really creepy experiences in this part of the forest in the past. And it felt a bit like those. The forest became dead silent, and you felt like something was watching you. There's that Sylvan Dread. Mm -hmm. I grew up in the woods, so I know the signs of a predator, but this felt different, different than a bear or a mountain lion. When night fell, my friends went 200 yards or so up the stream to do some stuff, and I was alone in the camp. The feeling got even stronger. So I built up the fire nice and big and grabbed a gun. I kept hearing faint voices from the woods in the opposite direction of where my friends went. They were low, indistinct sounds, but they were creeping me out majorly and my buddies had taken the only two flashlights. As I peered out into the darkness, I caught a glimpse of something moving 50 yards or so out in the trees. I snapped the rifle to my shoulder and got the scope on it. It was pretty dark, and the only light was from the fire, but I could see the outline of what I was aiming at. It looked human, but was on all fours, and its arms seemed a lot longer than they should. It's not a good sign. Mm -hmm. It stood a bit like an ape, but very low to the ground. I only saw it for a second before it loped off deeper into the woods. After I lost track of it, I'd heard light rustling in different directions around the camp. Leaves scuffling. The occasional twig breaking. Always away from where my friends went. In the 180 degrees on the other side of the camp from their departure. I got the sense that whatever it was, it was stalking me. I kept the fire high and was staying sharp, looking out into the trees, but I didn't see it again. My buddies came back about 10 minutes later to find me a paranoid wreck glassing the tree line with the scope. I told them what happened, and they got quiet, then told me the reason they came back when they did, is they started hearing the same things as I did. Over by where they were, and it spooked them. We spent the second night of our trip with a big fire and three lookouts. Nobody slept that night. We never camped in that spot again. Hmm. Definitely creepy. Yeah. Yeah, if it's a true story. Why do you always just um, see that? Yeah, Mr. <laughs> well, you know, you gotta... Why, why do you think it's not a true story? Well, the not, description of I the, think that it's true. I think whether or not he saw what he thinks he saw. Right, the, the um, human figure with the long, lopy arms. Mm-hmm. It loped off. Mm-hmm. Loped off on all fours. I mean, there actually is a likely true phenomena of feral humans in a lot of these wilderness feral places. Feral humans, you say? Yes. Wild people. Feral humans. That's less fun. No, but it's also freaky. Yeah, feral. Have you ever seen um, a wild U-Turn man? or whatever that movie's called? No, I have not actually. I think it's Wrong Turn. You know what I'm talking about? With Reese Witherspoon and... Reese Witherspoon. And Kiefer Sutherland? Is that, or is that no, Wrong that, Turn? That's the what a weird movie. last name. Witherspoon? Is your <laughs> spoon withered? <laughs> Like, Has your spoon withered? It's like a witch's name. I know. Like, <laughs> old lady with a spoon comes down from a mountain. Like, who made up that last name? They were just like, let's just pick a withered spoon. Uh-huh. Because I'm Maybe sure that's- she's capable. Like, with her spoon or fork, she can, can so. eat the dinner. It's a withered spoon. The name Witherspoon is Scottish. Its meaning is uncertain. Sheep pasture has been suggested. Okay. No. Oh. What was I saying about, oh, yes, the U turn movie? Or I think that's what it's called. I think it's called Wrong Turn. There were feral people. Are you ah. talking about like the hills have eyes? Y- no, but it's it's Same sort kind of, of like that, but it's in the woods. It's so uh-huh. creepy though. It's like feral humans, uh-huh. but they're so creepy. Yeah. <laughs> what? This is just sick, <laughs> cyclical description. <laughs> so there's like feral feral people, but they're like really creepy, but it's in the woods, but they're they're like feral though, but it's really <laughs> creepy. Yeah, I was emphasizing my point. <laughs> no, I like it. It's this. super creepy. Uh, but that's what it reminds me of. If those kind of feral people yeah. exist, they're so inbred so many times yeah. that they just turn into like monsters. Well, it reminds me of um, Steve Stockton. We covered this before, but the uh, he's got a good section of his book about feral yeah, humans. Yeah, his book on the Smoky Mountains National Park, I believe. Feral humans. The idea was that around the time when the national parks took over the land of the Smoky Mountains there. Oh yeah, this was really interesting. They took over the land. And so people had to like give up their homes. And, and this actually happened here in uh, Helltown. Yeah. Eminent domain was taken and people were forced to leave. Well, I thought you meant because of the feral humans. No, but that's what <laughs> happened. Allegedly, 
especially in the Smoky Mountains National Park, not so much in Helltown because it's a small town, but I'm not sure if it's 1700s, 1800s, maybe going back to 1600s where they, they'd built little villages out in the wilderness. Once it became parkland, the government took it from these people. They had kicked them out. Some people said, we're not leaving. How many people? How many people stayed there in like little, think of the village with mm-hmm. M. Night Shyamalan, these little tuckaway tribes. How many became feral or adopted their own kind of weird community potentially and how many became cannibals you hear about people getting attacked on trails out there by people things in the wilderness i mean it is a definite possibility that there are people that have survived yeah generations removed yeah i found newspaper reports going back when i was doing research for other episodes about wild men thinking it would be bigfoot or something and they were talking about this wild man that lived near a town in southern ohio like a right. hundred years ago. And they knew him. He'd come into town and people would see him by the railroad tracks. He'd be scavenging and then he'd be, he'd be all hairy because he wasn't civilized, quote unquote, and would go back in. But how many people have come across people like this? And they're just completely animalistic in a sense. Right. In this case, I still think it's a monster because monsters are fun. Well, it's a kind of monster really. <laughs> no, I know. I know. Maybe more of a tragic monster. But anyway, that's just one explanation yeah. for sure. Well, this kind of brings us to the idea we touched on earlier, which is the Sylvan Dread. The Oz effect. Right. The story we just read, he mentions that the forest becoming dead silent and the feeling of being watched before he has this encounter. Exactly. Reading through all these stories, I probably read through 50 stories, getting ready for this episode and trying to pick out ones we might cover. But that is a common theme. Whether something happens or not, there is something out there that people experience this kind of dread, unexplained, until they eventually see something or get disappeared. Right. And of course, you know? the skeptical, like, there's a psychological factor to that. But it is always fascinating, like we'll hear in this account, of yeah. when it's never happened to you in your entire life and you're an avid outdoorsman, and then one day suddenly for no explicable, no explainable reason, it does. Yeah. And it's like the morphic field we talked about. That's one possible explanation mm-hmm. too. Something is watching you. Even if it is a bear or a mountain yeah. lion, you can sense that. But when everything gets quiet. The morphic field, John, remember that? Where the idea of feeling mm-hmm. that you're being watched. Yeah. We did that on animal telepathy episode. But anyways, this comes from John Morris, a listener of the show. And brother of a Terry Zorko, a patron of ours, actually. Nice. Shout out there. But this is just kind of an interesting perspective on that phenomenon. Yes. And in his recounting of his experience, he mentions a book, Voices, which is Disembodied Voices by Tim Marchenko. True accounts of hidden beings. Definitely check it out. Amazing book. Yeah. Fantastic read. We've covered in depth on an episode dedicated to Disembodied Voices and covering his book. Link will be in the show notes for that guy. So definitely check it out. He goes deep into the research and a lot of lore from around the world about hidden beings and things that may be luring people into the wilderness, the lure, the trap. Check it out. All right. Let's hear John's account. Hi, my name is John Morris. I just joined today and I'm the brother of Terry Zorkel, who's a patron of yours. Been listening to your podcast for about a week and really love it. Thank you, John. On April 10th, I think it was, I took a backpacking trip on my own up to uh, San Jacinto, which is a 10,000 foot mountain down here in Southern California. During that time, I hadn't read voices or knew any of that stuff about the disappearances and anything until I got back. But in the meantime, I did, for once in my entire life, and I'm 66, experience Sylvan Dread. About halfway up, uh, around about 6,000 feet, ran into a, a set of trees and got, and I don't know, it's the first time I've ever actually been scared in my entire life, at least in that way, without any explanation whatsoever why. Instead of going back down, I managed to keep going up, which is really rough because it really starts climbing right about then. Uh, After I got about half a mile away from where it started at, I felt fine. You know, like it was nobody watching me, like it was a normal cruise in the mountains. Uh, In case you don't know it though, San Jacinto is also known as a peak named Takwitz, and there's a canyon by the same name, and that's where the tram from Palm Springs goes up to the top. It's named after a Coahuila Indian spirit who, oddly enough, disappeared people on a rare occasion and uh, finally was chased away by, I guess, one of the chiefs or the elders of the tribe. But it's got a really bad reputation in the general area, which I didn't think about until after reading that book, Voices, and uh, uh, talking to my sister and listening to the podcast. On the way back down, I passed the same area 
I uh, wound up getting mountain sickness and had to come down early. It uh, hadn't acclimated and it was getting really rough breathing and I'm not a spring chicken anymore. But I passed the same area and actually felt nothing. So that made me kind of, you know, it felt weird to begin with. The fact is that the same area was just as gloomy, spooky and eerie. Didn't bother me a bit. But on the way up, it scared the hell out of me. And that felt like the first time in my life I'd been hunted. Anyhow, enjoy your uh, your podcast. Listen to it at work every day. My boss thinks I'm crazy, but uh, it uh, <laughs> it really makes my day go by. And it's very interesting. And I want you guys to keep up the good work. Thank you. Thanks, John. Awesome. Yeah. That's great. Cool story. Yeah, I, what I love about that is that, you know, 66 years or so of, of being an avid outdoorsman and hiker. Yeah, right. Never... You know, first time. It's that deep intuition where mm-hmm. we just have an internal mechanism, I think, that exists. Instinctual. Instinctual when there's danger that we can't necessarily see. Mm-hmm. And that's probably what that is. Yeah. You know, it's yeah, just and that's the an electromagnetic field around us that's being disturbed. Yeah. Are we picking up the intention of whatever it is out there? And is it something natural, bear mountain lion, or is it in some cases, maybe this case, something a little more unexplainable? Yeah, there's a whole rabbit hole you can get down with uh, animal infrasound right. and the connection between uh, vibrational frequency and fear. I'm sure it's both. It goes back and forth. Clever man. It's interesting what he brought up about the native spirit there that was known in the area yeah. to disappear people. Yeah, that's you know? creepy. And is that a, a touchstone of something that is a ubiquitous phenomena, you know, going back through time in different areas just with a different name? Yeah, when you talk about the disappearances, when you talk about the traditions globally, like we talked about, we'll get into when we do the fairy stories after the break, it seems so bananas. It seems it seems so good word see, for it. It seems so out there to a lot of people, especially the idea of fairy folk, things like that. But when you talk about being taken in the forest, and when you talk about little people, some of the negative reports of these throughout folklore, throughout yeah. time, in all over the world, with all these connections. Like, sorry, it's the one thing I can never get over when we started doing the show was this specific concept of these gnomes and cross fairies. time cross cultural connections of little people mm-hmm. the hidden folk you know nodes of truth cross corroborative points well, we'll be doing that after the break yeah we got some really interesting stories coming after the break but uh what's coming up in the expansion before we go to the expansion i wanted to mention a friend of the show dr yes. jill cooper she is an animal communicator and psychologist and she was listening to the show i can't remember exactly why she got a hold of us anyway so i had some, i've had some issues with jake as far Your dog. as my dog, yes, if you don't know my dog. <laughs> and she helped work with me to understand him better. Like we did some phone calls back and forth. And Jake's issue is that he can be pretty aggressive and dominant for other animals. Or people. People too. <laughs> yeah. It's really more now when I'm walking around, it's just other dogs. Yeah. He just wants to just attack them. Yeah. Anyway, <laughs> so we did these sessions, a couple different sessions over the phone, and it really did help me understand Jake a little bit better. It helped me understand why Jake is the way he is. And I've been working with him after talking to her and it's, it's helped our relationship. And I kind of have a, a pathway forward to hopefully work on some of these behaviors. That's awesome. So I told her that we would mention her on the show and she is looking for people. If you have issues with your animal and you'd like to understand them a little bit better, She's actually, I mean, technically a dog psychic. She works with your animals. Awesome. She can help you kind of like... Yeah, she would work with Jake when I wasn't even there. Really? Yeah, so she would communicate with Jake. Oh, like remotely? Remotely, yeah. So, I mean, this is the show to talk about that. Right, Right. exactly. So (laughs) she's an animal communicator, psychologist, but dog psychic. Yeah. Short form. Yeah, there's a good chance people listening to the show might be open to that idea. So definitely check out that information. Yeah, so we will leave her information in the show notes. And if you have animal issues, she's definitely a good person to talk to. Absolutely. Awesome. Check it out, guys. And before we go to break, let's talk about the expansion real quick for all of our expansion members, what you can check out after this show's over. In the expansion episode, we're going to be discussing the fascinating concept of the veil between this life and the next or the previous, depending on how you look at it. I have some stories from a great book called Cosmic Cradle, Spiritual Dimensions of Life Before Birth, we might touch on. And most importantly, a really fascinating excerpt from an interview that John had. Oh, yeah. John, you want to tell us about that a little bit? Yeah, I interviewed a guy named Lamar Dixon Mm -hmm. about a year ago, and he's an ex-cop. And he had a crazy near-death experience from sleep apnea. Oh, so wow. he was asleep, and he actually had this crazy experience where he ended up waking up in space. And so I'll leave it there for now, but we have an excerpt of that that we're going to play. And Mm -hmm. then, yeah, like it's kind of a mishmash of 
some near death experience stuff. And also I think the veil is such a fascinating yeah. topic. That of, mechanic of like between life and death and, yeah. and reality, this reality and the next mm-hmm. or whatever, however you want to refer to it. I love the idea of the mechanic of that. Right. Like what is that, that kind of membrane? Yeah. So for those of us in the audience, John, who aren't familiar with the concept of the veil from the perspective of the kinds of experiencers that you're going to be covering in the expansion, give us a little taste of what that is. I mean, to even explain it, yeah. it's, it's basically just a quick overview of what it is. It's before we come into this life, we come from such a, a higher state of being that in order to incarnate into this lower density world, we actually have to wear something called the veil. It's like an emotional energy body that... <laughs> oh, weird. <laughs> Not what I was expecting. That... Didn't you do research on this? Yeah, but the veil in relationship to like the veil being the curtain between here and the next world. Oh, But not the specific concept of the veil you're talking about where you wear it like a cloak. Well, I don't know the exact details of what it is, but it basically allows us to forget everything else. You know, if if you believe that we are these souls on this endless journey of lifetimes, it allows us to forget where we came from and start over basically and drop our frequency low enough to come into this material low density world. Right. So I'm going to be bringing some stuff from a guy named Christian Sundberg. Okay. And he claims to remember actually having it happen to him. Yeah. And he actually, I don't know if I want to spoil it because it's pretty interesting. Well, then yeah, save it. But yeah. So if you guys want to jam with us yeah. on the other side, yeah, get, don't let the fun stop. Yeah. We're going to get some really interesting stories. And um, no matter what you believe about the beyond and the life after death, it's just a really fascinating exploration into people's personal accounts. And we also have a hundred other episodes. Yeah, we do have a ton of content. If you guys aren't members, go to beliefhole.com and click the big red, join the expansion button, and you will be blown away. All right, here's a clip from this expansion episode. Access granted. I'm on my back and I'm asleep. And then when you're when you're getting ready to dream, you really don't know when you're going to dream. You just you know you're going to sleep, you're tired, and then all you know, you're out. This is different, right? It didn't go into a dream, but it went into me, literally, my spirit, my soul, waking up in outer space. I closed my eyes and my spiritual essence, me, woke up in outer space. What was that like? Warm, warm, comfortable, relaxing. Was it like stars and stars, gases, galaxies, like outer space? It's space. We're we are in it, my friend. And I'm looking around, and instantly in my mind, my mind is so hard to like bring things together but right. instantly I'm like I must be dead but in like this real environment right. of space right? my conscious told me you know first off like I didn't have the weight of my body I didn't have the, the stress of the physical earthly experience it was all shed it all obliterated ego gone I instantly had this rekindling of myself oh man I'm out of it. I just I just got pulled out of it, the system, the matrix. I'm I'm out of it. And I'm like, I'm I must be dead. And then right when I said that is when, like when the fireworks start happening. It's just like, oh yeah. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. When the cool light of the blood moon beckons, the midnight call won't be ignored. And every creature of the night looking for love needs the right scent to snare their heartthrob. In partnership with Ruddy Man Grooming, the brothers of the Belief Hole have curated Night Stalker. A beard oil scent that blends the masculine, earthy forest aroma with the seductive notes of tobacco and vanilla Mm. for a subtly sweet balance that will have your partner purring late into the evening. However the night moves you, Night Stalker Beard Oil is your loyal companion. Yes! So head over to Beliefhole.com and click on the Night Stalker button. Available in beard oil, bombs, and butters. And don't forget to use the code Beliefhole for 15% off your purchase. That's Beliefhole, one word, all lowercase. 
Night Stalker for a superior breed of beard. Welcome back, Beliefings. <laughs> John's got his witch voice on. Crypt Keeper's here. What a good show. At least in my memory. I don't know if it holds up, but... Some unsettling episodes. Definitely just the intro was fun. Yeah. One episode always sticks out to me is the one where the guy's wife was cheating and he was like some... He had like a laboratory in the basement and he ended up switching the heads of his <laughs> wife and her lover. <laughs> that was very disturbing. Yeah. All right. Let's get back into the forest. We're going to start dissecting the strange phenomena that people experience of being lured into the woods by the woods itself. Are the woods taking people? Is there a force that can use the woods it itself? Are the trees making up kind of a connective... Like a prison root system? Prison root? Like creating a prison out of yeah. roots and trees. Yeah, that kind of idea. It's a literal way to think about it. It's interesting. Underground, there's people just trapped in... Like That's Evil scary. Dead style, just the trees pulling you. Know, you know, we did talk about in our that expansion episode on Strange Wilderness, we talked about the recent studies about plant communication and how there's that mycelia network oh, yeah. where the, tr uh, the trees themselves are using the fungi under the forest floor to communicate with each other. That's an interesting idea. Yeah. Not to say that they're villainous trees that are taking people. Villainous trees. But the communication itself is interesting. Well, there is this idea, something out there, whether it's operating in a way that changes your perspective, your mental state, to hallucinate certain things, to trap you in a way, or whether there's a physical change maybe a quantum level change of what's going on. And you'll hear that in some of these experiences, these almost taken kind of experiences coming up here. And this one was interesting. And this sounds familiar to me, almost like I felt this feeling before. And this was, again, a comment, someone responding to a video about these almost taken experiences. And she had her own experience, which I found really kind of grabbing. This comes from Debbie Roberts, posted three years ago. And we'll have these linked in the show notes. I call this Summoned by Trees. Whenever I hear about missing people being found dead in places they would never have gone or had any business being, I think of this incident that happened to me. My husband and son wanted to spend two days coyote hunting in the mountains of Utah, a couple hours drive from where we live. It's a place we've been going to for years to dry camp and hunt. I decided to go with them and just chill and enjoy the mountains. They left at dusk to go hunt and I relaxed on the bed in our trailer reading. The next thing I know, I'm standing on the opposite side of an enormous clearing of rocks and scrub from my trailer, and I was headed into deep, dark woods. If I hadn't come to my senses when I did, I would have ended up lost in the woods at night, or worse. At the time I came to, I don't know what else to call it. I felt a push to keep going into the dark woods ahead, but also an abject terror that overcame it. And that sent me stumbling and running back across the field. It was terribly rough going to get across, and I was lucky to find my trailer in the dark. Once back and thinking it over, I had a vague, very dreamlike memory of putting on my boots and leaving the trailer, but not crossing the field. It was just like I'd been hypnotized and then been snapped awake from it. I know it all sounds so crazy, so I never told anyone about it. But after hearing the stories, I decided to share. I try never to be alone when I'm in the mountains now. Never. Yeah. That's that, really creepy. Yeah. Right? That is a common story. I mean, I've heard that account. We've covered several accounts Summoning. of that. Yeah. Yeah. There were people don't know why, but they find themselves. There's a fantastic story. It happened, I believe, in the Amazon. But a man who was with a group and he kind of was, you know, on his own. He wasn't respecting the rules. And then at some point he found himself just alone in the jungle. And eventually I think he was found, but he he had almost died. But he said it was like when he finally regained his faculties, he said how he just, he couldn't explain it and he couldn't fight it. But he had this, this feeling of just like he just needed to walk out. Scary. Yeah. yeah. That was like really scary. Well, it connects to that concept with the water, that phenomenon where you can be drawn to like people that walk off waterfalls. Oh, yeah. Because they're just drawn 
so much we don't know about the mind and how frequencies and things play on our yeah is it just an odd aberration of nature that does this or is there is there a reason is there something feeding no, off of this consciousness yeah, there's so much it. we can't see either oh yeah we're surrounded like by our, stuff our spectrum of light that we can see and the auditory senses are, are so limited yeah compared to what's everything that's going on around us it's kind of like the veil in a sense yeah but it's true jeremy it's true right thank you <laughs> <laughs> but the, i heard a story just real briefly about this bicyclist he and his friends were on a mountain biking trail and he was much faster. So he got further down the trail and on his way back, he stopped and felt apparently drawn to the river. He heard the stream babbling next mm-hmm. to the track, got off his bike, walked towards the stream, took off all his clothes and laid down. Well, that's bizarre. And fell asleep. And then his friends were like, where is Ted or whatever. It's so was. scary. Yeah. I would be like, how do you trust yourself after that? Exactly. Dude. Same kind of thing. Yeah. Luckily in this case, his friends found him or like, what are you doing? What happened? And you he almost think you were drugged or something. Yeah, exactly. It's like when I drive by a pizza hut, my window's down. <laughs> so then I find, my, I find myself in line. <laughs> what am I doing? <laughs> okay. Moving along. So here's another example, guys. And this comes from John H. Fox. So I call this the path not taken. And this is kind of a, a freaky example of a possible explanation for some of these accounts. I grew up in the forests of Appalachia, and in the 60s, it was really about as rural as you could get east of the Mississippi River. I was about 10, and as at home in the woods as the rest of the animals. This day, I was going to check some fish traps I had set. I wasn't more than four miles from home on a lazy summer afternoon. Going along, daydreaming as boys that age often do, I wasn't paying much attention to my surroundings. After all, This was practically my backyard. The path to the creek where my traps were led down through a low spot, then back uphill, finally curving to the left. Except this day, it didn't. Instead, this day, the trail led right over the low spot now. Now if I hadn't used that trail regularly, I might not have noticed the change, being as I was going along almost on autopilot I came to a dead stop, hair standing up on my neck, and looked closely at what was now a fork in the path, a fork I had never seen before. It was like seeing two pictures split, the way a mirror in a funhouse distorts perception. I could see the trail I remembered, but it was somehow muted to my senses unless I stared directly at it. At the same time, the new path seemed really clear and sharp. Just the kind of path a person would take if their mind was somewhere else. That's a scary thought. Looking back, I always think of Hansel and Gretel and the gingerbread house that was a trap. Yeah, I screwed up my courage and streaked past the junction faster than the Lone Ranger could shoot an outlaw in his gun hand. I got my fish, took a longer way home, and didn't go back there for months. Funny thing, when I did decide to take another look, I couldn't find any branching trail. And that suited me fine. Even a 10-year-old knew there couldn't be anything on that path but a gingerbread house. Interesting. I wonder if any other people that are listening have had that experience. Because I've heard experiences of people saying like, I don't know how I got off that trail. I've been walking that trail for years. So I wonder how many people have thought that. Like I took this path, Mm -hmm. like that it just stopped paying attention because it was something so familiar to them. Yeah. And then they find themselves somewhere else. It's a frightening thought. Much like what you were discussing earlier, John, about the idea of being led somewhere, waking up, not knowing how you got there. Interesting idea of of nature, Mm -hmm. nature deceiving. There's another story that we're going to do in another episode that happened in the Sonoran Desert. Basically this evil force, they called it, it, that could possess you, make you want to kill each other or kill yourself, and it would chase you. Creepy. It's creepy. We'll do that in in a future episode. It's a Wendigo idea. But I'm just mentioning it because in that area... The idea was that it couldn't pass the power lines. Oh, that's interesting. There's something about the energy that whatever this force was, was allergic or it couldn't exist where the electrical grid existed. And you hear the argument all the time that, well, as we encroach on nature, we run into these things when you get deep into the wilderness, but just the existence of civilization precludes this thing from existing alongside us. So we don't know it's there until it's too late. I mean, that's kind of an idea. It's out there, but yeah. We talked about before that research on how the connection of people having experiences with ghost encounters during reading and how people don't read from books as much as they used to sitting alone in a sitting room to read. And you wonder how much connection we're losing from the spirit world. 
because we're just we're engaged with beaming Phones from our computers and, and all that electromagnetic interference. Yeah, it's just got to do all sorts of weird stuff. That's the argument. We're like an experiment race right now. Well, yeah, time period in our history. Technology is so new still, and all of the. I mean, think about smoking and how that took a long time to really figure out. Everyone knows that people are highly addicted to their cell phone. I mean, this is a whole other topic, right. but I do feel like we're, we're an experiment right now. Yeah. And everyone's a part of it, even the people that create it. Yeah. You know. Oh, for sure. It's just so ingrained in our society now. I was thinking about this in the shower the other day. I was thinking how much of my life with research and editing on the computer, and then when I want to relax tonight or something, I'll put on YouTube or something, then how reality and, and being in the real world is like, it's a break from life. Like so much of my life with my work right. and my research and then my leisure time, if I'm just like chilling at the end of the night, so much of it is screen time in the internet that, yeah. that the real world is like, maybe I'll take a break and yeah. go to reality. Not a good it balance. Is, I mean, that's, that's scary. Yeah. Like, yeah, the break that is me out. the reality, you know? And then sometimes you go out in the real world and you're like, this feels weird. And anyone that does like a computer job and works eight, 10 hour days, like they know this feeling. Mm -hmm. They were yeah. doing web design back in the day, getting into it just like constantly on the screen you get out and you look at like you, I put a berry in my hand and I was like, is this real? Like the real world does not seem real <laughs> yeah. anymore. And that seems like the simulation. Meditation is good for that. I'm definitely going to start doing some med meditation. It's interesting because this whole conversation works right into our last two accounts here mm. because it's the concept of the things that, that seem to be taken for granted that these things were real. Faith folk, before I think the world moved on, so to speak, before we got so deep down our own wells of technology there was more belief. We've lost the magic because there was, you know, arguably more encounters with things like fey folk, things like that. And as we talked about moving away from the woods yeah, or eating into it with construction and our right. own civilization, the fern gully problem. Yeah. So let's hear some outlying examples of the encounters that people are still having with these spirits of the forest. Yeah. So I call this section seriously. What the F are fairies? Because what are they? You know, I mean, you real, real creative. <laughs> well, F for fairies, you know. Oh, I get but it. Okay. Reading the fairy census, this is a great source to go back to for just strange encounters with things. And a lot of them are just tucked in the fairy category because yeah. they're unexplained wilderness encounters with these kind of elementals or just bizarre things. Some, some are exactly fairy described, small people with wings and old handmade clothing and, you know, carrying candles around, like just weird details. Some are more Nisa-like with gnomes with the pointed right. hats. So I picked a couple of weird ones for the remaining couple in this episode. And uh, this first one comes from Hampshire, England in the 2000s. And uh, the woman was in her 40s. I think she remained anonymous for this. This happened around late morning to noon when she hadn't had any history of supernatural experiences. Chris, do you want to read this one? She's relaxing at her campsite. Sure. Oh, and I call this Man of Sticks. I was sitting on the open back of a flatbed trailer in a field. There were a number of other people in the field, but they were busy elsewhere. I was relaxing, just gazing across the fence into the woods, when suddenly a very large humanoid creature, twice the height of a normal human, which appeared to be made out of sticks, jumped out of a tree about 30 meters from me. He landed in a crouched position with one hand on the ground in front of him. He seemed to look at me for about five seconds, then jumped straight back up into the tree and sort of strode away in the branches along the line of the fence to the corner of the field, where he turned away from me and went out of sight. I and a friend, whom I called over, went and examined the place where he jumped down and where he turned and went away. We found nothing but a strong smell of decay like a skeleton made out of sticks. It didn't look like a ghost or an alien. It didn't have wings. It might easily have been some other type of anomalous experience, but not having any other way of categorizing it, I have chosen to ascribe it to fairies. Weird. That's super bizarre. I've never heard a stick man before. <laughs> no, <laughs> there is a phenomenon called stick man, but it's, uh, I think it has to do with this thing that's so thin that if it turns to the side, you can barely see it like a stick figure. But remember our first Strange Wilderness episode in the expansion where this was like a couple seasons ago, what we talked about, there was the one research writer who was doing a book on something unrelated to fairy lore, fey lore, but he crossed what's termed as like a green man, which is oh, sort yeah, of semi-common, especially in Europe. 
he said this thing was, it looked like it was made of leaves and whatever. And then it ran off back into the tree line right. when he drove past it. This was in Ireland, I believe. There are a lot of accounts of fairy type reports of them looking like being made of leaves or having a body that almost, you see like this, the uh, stick insects, the walking yeah. sticks, mm-hmm. like mantis type. And it's perfect camouflage. Yeah, like some look exactly like two leaves put together and that's the thorax, that kind of thing. Yeah. And so, yeah, the green man or this thing, a giant made of sticks. Mm-hmm. It makes you wonder. Yeah. I mean, if there is a reality to that, like it could explain so many. Well, no one would believe you anyway. If, right. you, if there was something out there and you saw that, you told someone, be like, okay, okay, yeah. Gene. Stop taking your drugs. Yeah. Did you find some mushrooms in that for us? Is that not why you saw this? Yeah. That would be the response in general. So for the last one, I just grabbed kind of a, kind of a fun one here. Uh, it's called Pissing on the Wee Folk. Fun if you're not the Wee Folk. <laughs> That's a good point. Is we a pun in this title? Ooh, there you go. Yeah, I don't like the word piss. I just, just sounds weird to me. I know, I'm not a fan. Why'd you title it that then? That's what, I think he refers to it. Maybe he didn't. Maybe I should say that. Weeing on the wee folk. Yeah, this is called A Wee on the Wee Folk. This comes from England in Essex. This happened in the 1980s when a fellow was camping in open land near a farm's hedgerow, which also, by the way, is where you can hear sheep talking. Sheep talk, human language. Oh, that's the story you left the out. The story right? I left out because we didn't have time, so I'll say that story for another time, but a lot of uh, talking sheep out there in England. Anyways, this happened between midnight and 3 a.m. in the morning. Always the time. Right? John, I'm going to let you read this one if you, if you want, if you're down. Sure. Just imagine yourself camping near an open field on the moors of Essex. I was camping near the moors with a group. One night I had nature's call, but didn't want to walk the distance to the porta potties. Twas late. <laughs> so instead, I went directly behind my tent to the hedgerow to take a leak. As I prepared to, er, unleash, (laughs) suddenly, right in front of me, when I looked down, appeared silhouetted a small shape with his hands on his hips. I could see it by a faint light coming through a large hole behind him in the hedgerow. I got the impression of someone very angry. This scared me, and needless to say, I could not do what I had intended. Slowly backing away, I quickly apologized. Sincerely believed I had almost pissed on a wee folk. Got fast back in my tent and spent the next couple of hours casting protective circles and wards around me within my tent. In the morning upon waking, I immediately searched the hedgerow for that large hole I saw behind the creature, but discovered that there was absolutely no break or hole in the hedge anywhere near where I was. Follow-up detail. (laughs) Humanoid. The size of a toddler. <laughs> Couldn't see anything but a silhouette framed by a strange faint light. Okay, I don't think I'm supposed to read that. Anymore. Yeah, that's just as involved I was going to kind of run through. But yeah, no, that's he was the size of a toddler and he was silhouetted by the light behind the hedgerow, which apparently that hole didn't exist there when he woke up the next day. So was it just a, was it a fairy portal perhaps yeah. that he could see this thing? He said it didn't feel like an encounter with the dead or any kind of angelic or alien type thing. Nothing to compare with. Oh, and he said, uh, basically came with the idea of don't mess with them. They will kick your ass and enjoy doing so. That's kind of the idea of the fairy, really. Yeah. Is that like... Respect them. Yeah. They sound... I mean, we have the Disney idea now, but from all accounts going back through time... They can be a little uppity. Yeah. They were were forced to be reckoned with. You don't want to piss one off or become the target of one. If you believe in the wee folk. I mean, remember Leprechaun the movie? Uh, exactly. Yep. And that's <laughs> that all based on true scary, accounts. dude. Remember Leprechaun in the Hood? Do you, do you remember who was starred in that, John? <laughs> oh, yeah. It was uh, Jennifer Aniston. Oh, I thought you meant the Leprechaun. <laughs> oh, so did I. I was like, <laughs> what? They did a really good job of making her look different. <laughs> Leprechaun was uh, Willow. Remember Willow? Off good? Oh, oh yeah. yeah. Matt Modigan. His name's is it Warlock Davis? Yes. What a name for a uh, little person. Oh, it's, it's Warwick Davis. Warwick Davis. Oh, I thought, Did yeah. I say? You said Warlock. Okay. <laughs> Great actor. I love that guy. Oh, dude, Willow would be such a good watch along. We should definitely do a watch along with Willow, man. That and Phantasm. Uh, just to touch on that story, I love that compendium of accounts from this, um, what's it called? The, the Fairy Census? Fairy Census. Go ahead and get yourself a copy if you don't have one. We'll have a link in the show notes too. I think you can, yeah, you can get it from our website. Really fascinating. Just hundreds of accounts from all over the world. Yeah, Kentucky, Louisiana. The, I didn't think there were so many fairy accounts in the States. Yeah. That kind of surprised me. I'd love me. to do a, just a whole another episode dedicated to fairy lore again. It's been a couple of years since we've done a fairy episode. Yeah. Yeah, let us know if you guys are interested in hearing more Faye accounts. I know they're, it's somewhat more of an out there idea. Just Googling Warwick Davis. <laughs> now I'm looking at Val Kilmer. All right. Well, any final thoughts on the forest? <laughs> What's the lesson here today, guys? I think the lesson is we all need to go back to the forest. Put down your phone, mm-hmm. get outside, 
but keep your eye out for fairy folk. Chris, why don't you take us home with a campfire message for all our campers out there? I hope you guys enjoyed today's episode Deep in the Woods. When you go out into the woods, just remember that there might be something out there that needs respecting. I think it's irrefutable that there is an ancient feeling when you go really deep, really deep into the forest. Especially in some of these places more than others, there's just a feeling. And if you guys out there, if you experience anything like this, we're going to, I think, continue doing the series Camp Creeply, which Chris has strangely named for this series. So throughout the coming years of the Belief Hole, we'll continue to do this. So if you have any strange camping experiences... Um, Especially if you happen to have any that involve being at a camp, as in Chris really wants to do I really like, want like camp counselor stories, you know, like real strange experiences because we've had a couple submitted. Yeah, and we I think part of the reason is because we grew up going to camp, you know, and I love that romance of yeah. the going to this place for a week at a time. You're at the lodge and there's like, you know, you have a fire and, you yeah. know, even if you went to a specific camp and you guys had like a an urban legend at the camp, that'd be kind of cool to cover too. Mm-hmm. If you're talking about just getting in the spirit of that. But mainly real, strange stories. <laughs> Chris really wants real yeah. ones. That's what we shoot for here in we the We hope that this episode, taking you out of summer and into the strange winds of fall, when the veil finally lifts, we hope you've enjoyed it. Don't forget to check out the expansion where we're going to lift up a little bit of that veil. Oh, absolutely. So if you aren't signed up, go sign up now. And now it's time for the thank yous. Yes. Now it's time to thank some very special people to the whole. People that have signed up at the Black Eyed Cool Kids level and up. Yes. To get their names shouted out on the show. Thank you so much for your support. Thank you for being here yes. and keeping the lights on. We rely on your guys' support to keep the hole alive and deepening. Don't kill the hole. Don't kill the hole. <laughs> Don't let the hole die. And thank you to everyone who are about to read now. All right. Thank you to Tina. Tina, Tina. Yes, Thank you. that's her name. Matthew Richards. Hey, Matthew. <laughs> God. <laughs> so creative today. Welcome in. We love you. Miss Cat. Thank you so much for being here. Another cat? This is Miss Cat. Oh, Miss Cat. Yeah. So no, it's hard to know how many, which cats Keep are which. Going. Yeah, so many cats. Squirt McGurkin. Oh, <laughs> yeah. It's here. You so got to, me, Squirt. So that's a fun name. Uh, Tyler... Cron Cron Shaggin. All right, Cron Shaggin. Hop into my beliefful wagon. Okay. <laughs> Pelham Johnston is here. Welcome to the hole. I don't even yes. know. Pelham, that's Welcome an interesting in. word. Welcome, sir. Yes, thank Welcome you so much for being here. here. Rochelle Gennett. Yes. Or Ganay. Rochelle yes. Ganay. You can make a flambe for me anytime. You just made our day. You did. Misty Lear is here. Oh, Misty Lear. Eh. Awesome. <laughs> What's that? I don't know. See, Miss, that was like, is your brain blanked out? My brain was just ah. like, eh. Thank you, Misty. We love you. You can leer at us anytime. You are so pretty. <laughs> you <laughs> <Yes. always> <laughs> yeah, can't do anything. Just compliment the ladies. Uh, Jonathan Parra yes. is here. Yes. Jonathan yes. Parra. Jonathan Parra. Yes. Yes. Welcome in, yes. Jonathan. Yes. yes. Excellent. Uh, thank you so much. You're <laughs> welcome to be here. Jenna Faye Patrick. Ooh, Ooh. Faye. Ooh, perfect. We got a yes. fairy here, it sounds yes. like. Harry fairy. This sounds Irish with the Patrick. Probably not a Harry fairy. Yeah. I would guess not. Welcome in. Uh, Nathan Labia. Awesome. Nope. Uh, Laba. <laughs> yes. Laiba. I'm not sure yes. how to pronounce your name. Welcome in, Nathan. Thank you so much. We've got a hot dog for you. Sincerely. <laughs> <laughs> what? Nathan's hot dogs. <laughs> okay, sure, okay. Uh, Connor Mulholland is here. Welcome, Connor. Ooh, Mulholland yes. Drive. Yes. Another Irish sounding name. Hope you're enjoying the, the Fay lore, Connor. Jonathan Meacham is here. Oh, another Jonathan. I once played a character named Doc Meacham. He cooked mangoes. Cool. Uh, Thanks, Jonathan. Thank you, Jonathan. I'm Jonathan. Yes, you are as well. <laughs> Camille Odell is here. All right. Welcome in, Camille. Welcome mm. to be here. Awesome. Sweet lady of, of light. Charlotte L. Lenzen. Yes. 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 <laughs> she is also here. Our brains blinked Dude, out, apparently. We, we used to get names that, like, it was easy to come up That's with right, something, yeah. and everyone now seems getting harder. I know. Welcome in, Charmier. But welcome in, Charlotte. Thank you so much. Charlotte's Web. Here we go. <laughs> That's the thing. Uh, Jade <laughs> Finglin. Finglin. Yes. Jade oh, yes. Finglin. Shine my emerald. <laughs> okay, like Jade. With okay, your sure. Yes. Jade Finglin. Thank, thank you. you so much. Thank you, thank you. Uh, Morton Nilsson ah, is Morton here. Morton Nilsson. Isn't that a famous actor? So you're thinking of Vorgo Me- uh, no. Meatenson. Morton Nilsson? <laughs> We're pretty sure that's a famous actor. <laughs> well, why don't you Google in the background while I continue okay, here? Okay, uh, Coy Cavernous. You don't have to be coy with us, sir. No. Jump right onto the yes. hole. Yes. It's yes. cavernous down here. We appreciate you so much. Thank you sincerely. Welcome in. He's a poet. Oh, is he? Well, Maybe it's the same guy. Poet, and we didn't know it. I think he's dead. dead. 
Okay. That's probably, that's probably not the right... Uh... We love you, Morton. Yes. Morton. Um, Jenny Fields. All right, Jenny Fields. Fields yes. of beauty. Yes. 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 We would run through those fields any day for a Dogman Whisperer like you. Thank yes. you so much for being here. Erica Plant. Nope. Yes. Erica Pant. Yes. Erica, Erica Pant. Pant. <laughs> One leg only in those <laughs> pants. <laughs> Erica Pant, that is an awesome name. <laughs> Welcome. <laughs> we love you, Erica. Yeah, Dogman Whisperer. What a hero of the whole. Great. What a hero. Thank you so much. We really do appreciate it, Erica. You are awesome. Nancy Lindler. Yes. Ooh. Yes. Ooh. Yes. Spindler Lindler. I don't like that. A spindler. Is that a good thing? Welcome in, Nancy. Welcome so much, Nancy. Nancy. We much appreciate it. Samuel Arnold is here. Welcome to the Be Here. All right. You can flip his name around. Arnold Samuel. We'll take that, too. Two first names. You always trust a guy with two first names. That's what Oops. I say. Caleb Sims is mixing up the music. It's, uh, <laughs> you got the DJ in town here. <laughs> <Ba-bam>! <laughs> a little trumpet there. Welcome in, Caleb. Caleb Sims, thank you so much, man. Seriously, do appreciate it. Jesse Kessler. All right. Welcome in, Jesse. Don't mess with the Jess. Uh, uh, yes. <laughs> <laughs> think of anything else. Uh, thank you so much, Jesse. Um, Ryan is here. Yes. Dogman Whisper for the win. All oh, right, Ryan. Yes. Thank you so much for being here, my Not friend. Not to be confused with Brian. Yes. Crying Ryan. Damon awesome. Stillmock. <laughs> Still my mock, Dennis. Da- I think it says Damien. What's his name? Damon? Damien. Damien. Oh, Damien. Ooh. Ooh. He's got a little freaked out. Scary. I'm sure he gets that all the time. But he bet he's a handsome chap. Welcome in, Damien. Audrey Machman is Welcome. here. Macho Man. Awesome. Welcome, Audrey. <laughs> Macho Man. Uh, Alexa. Hi, I am Alexa. Alexa. I wonder if that's the Alexa. <laughs> yes, it is. Welcome, Alexa. AI has it is, really grown. Jeremy. <laughs> Thank you so much, Alexa. We sincerely appreciate your Thank support. You. Logan Pop. All right. <laughs> crackle Snap. <laughs> Welcome Great in. Pop sound effects. <laughs> Speaking of elves. Snap, crackle, pop. Thank you so much, Logan, for being here. You sly fox, you. Stephen Payne. Ow. Bring the pain, Stephen. Welcome in, Stephen. When you're here, it's all pleasure, Stephen. And f- that'll be our last for today. All as right. The music has ended, and we got through, I think, a good little number there, guys. Thank you guys so much yes. for being here in the whole with us. Thank you for supporting the show. If you haven't signed up, don't forget, double the episodes, double no the fun. No one is here that hasn't signed up at this point. They've all... Left. I think some people just really enjoy hearing people's names read with funny terms. <laughs> Maybe like three. <laughs> funny, right? I can't imagine there's one person though that hasn't signed up that has listened this far yet. It's too far. I bet there is, and they're about to take the plunge. But if you are and you haven't signed up, think about all the joy you're missing. That's probably what hurts so much. Yes. Okay, we gotta go. Guys, thank you seriously so much for being here. Uh, Jeremy, you've already said it like eight times. Well, that's fine. I would like to thank them. I'm appreciative of all of we you. We hope to see you on the other side. And for the people that are watching us with us on YouTube, Oh yeah, hide at the chat. You are rock stars. This is the meta part. Hi guys. We love you. Stay out of the woods. And if you go in there and have an experience, just be careful. Yeah. Yeah. And also let us know about it. Definitely. Share your story. Bluefield.com and click on the share your story button. It's somewhere in there. Okay. See you next time on Bluefield. Back to the show. So getting into the deeper into the woods in the wilderness. Deeper into the woods. John's had his daily snack, so he's got his energy. <laughs> <laughs> now he's going to make a deeper into the woods thing. John sounds like the witch who owned the gingerbread house. I wish house. I could go back and get every one I did and be able to play them randomly. That would be awesome. <laughs> that would take so long. Just for every, yeah, like because we had so many that were just like... like oh, that one will be useful. <laughs> yeah. It's like so not useful. <laughs> Oh, what was the one? Hot dogs and peanut, peanut butter. butter. Don't be stingy. Share, Share them with your brother. brother. Peanut butter peanut wiener. Peanut butter wiener. That one never made it. No. no. I think we should definitely do a watch along with Willow, man. That and Phantasm. Yeah. About the story real quick. Kaya. We can't keep a Kaya. Kaya, we can't keep her. She's a daikini. She's a daikini. <laughs> I was going to do that too, but I thought through you were We all know the same quote. Peck, 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 peck. That was my next one I was going to go to. Don't forget to check out the expansion. where We're going to lift up a little bit of that veil. Oh, absolutely. Like the skirt of your mistress. Yes, yeah, sure. That's a good way to go to the afterlife. <laughs> no, he said, lift the veil. I said, like the skirt of your mistress. Yeah, no, I thought it was a good analogy for... Because you're excited. Uh-huh. 
you know, the skirt okay. of your mistress. I tried. <laughs> that was a good visual. <laughs> <laughs>